glorify your holy name. We worship you. We adore you. We praise you, Lord Father. We thank you for the glorious life that you have given unto us. Father, we worship you. We honor you, Lord. We thank you for your protective hand. We thank you that we are in your hands. Just as we are in the hands of Jesus Christ, we are in your hand. And no one, no devil, no plants can snatch us away from you. Because you are our Father. We are hidden in you. Oh, Father, we just worship you. We glorify your holy name. We adore you, Lord, this day. We praise you, Lord. Oh, Father, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Ghost that dwelleth within us. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that activated and energized us daily. Oh, Father, we just worship you. Our hearts and minds are open to hear from you, Lord, Father. This day, every single word, we meditate on your word. The word that is able to build us up. We are edified by your word this day. We give attention to your word, O oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. We are here again today, and uh, we are about to talk about um, who is a Christian. Who is a Christian? Now, I know that we all know who a Christian is. We have the view that this is who a Christian is. But the question is, do we? I've heard so many different information about who a Christian is. And I've also known that, yes, there are many who does not even understand what it means to be a Christian. We have asked so many questions. Are you a Christian? Yes. Are you born again? Mm, no, I don't think so. But I'm a Christian. Then why do you call yourself a Christian and you are not born again? Oh, born again is for the Pentecostals. We are the Methodist. We are the Evangelist. Or we are different type of names. So for that, that is another type of Christians. And that is not the truth. That is not the truth. And right now, at this point in time in our lives, we are in the 21st century. And I can assure you, we are on this last lane of the last lap for the coming of the Lord. The word has always been, the Lord is coming. Jesus is coming back very soon. But I can be rest assured and I can tell you, truly, the time is practically very close. And the devil knows that. The host of devils and demons, they know that. So this period, they are throwing everything they have. Everything. The Bible says, gross darkness, darkness on the nations, and gross darkness. This is that time that the Bible talks about. Different things will be coming that the Bible, even the children of God, if they don't take time, they can be swayed or deceived. And the greatest swearing of this issue, the greatest point, is who is a Christian. This is the time for you to know who you are in the Lord. This is the time for you to know who a Christian is. Because if you don't, in your secret chambers, in your bedrooms, in your closet, what are you thinking? Is there fear? Am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? Am I going to heaven? Is that what you are thinking? This is the time to know the truth for yourself. This is the time to know the truth for yourself. That is why we are doing this topic. Who is a Christian? 
the, based on the introduction, we have, why do we study this? Like I said, we are studying this because we are at a time that we need to know who we are. So the first part we are going to deal with, why are we studying it? And the second part is we are going to deal with who is a Christian? What does it mean to be saved? What we say, yes, I'm saved. You are saved. What does it mean to be saved? Then the third part is who initiated this salvation? And for what purpose? Who initiated this salvation and for what purpose? The fourth part is, as a Christian, what is your function on earth? As a Christian, what is your function on earth? And lastly, we'll be talking about what is the result of not functioning rightly as a Christian on earth. So let's begin. Why do we study this topic who is a Christian? Like I said, we are in a crucial time. We are in a crucial time. There are deceptions going on. There are different type of tricks going on all around the world right now. People are shaking. People are threatened. And there are different information that relates to the last days that is actually affecting people now. Don't forget, the Bible says that the Antichrist will come later, but the spirit of the Antichrist is already around. So even if the Antichrist is not here yet, or if, it has not been, if he has not been revealed yet, that doesn't mean that the spirit of the Antichrist is not functioning now. It is. So for that reason, we need to know where we are. That is why we study this. If we open our Bible to Matthew 24, from verse 6, Jesus warned about this period. And I'll read from verse 6, 24. Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Be that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdoms, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. Let's stop here first. Because of the attack, because of the afflictions on the world, many different kind of prophets will arise. Different kind of information will come up. Different kind of... Look at the churches right now. They are more afraid of what the world will do to them than what the word of God said. This is the time. There is affliction. Church has been closed down. Even the pastors are afraid to open the churches right now. They are afraid of the diseases, of the viruses, of the ailments that they are supposed to stretch forth their hands and heal. The church of God is supposed to be the heaven of healing. Like the spiritual hospital. For those that are sick. But the church of God is now where the fear is. That's what he's saying here. From verse 9 again. He said, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, 
and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. Among brethren, among Christians, there will be offense. Some are saying what you are saying is correct. Oh, what you are saying is not correct. A pastor against another pastor. A brother against another pastor. A pastor against his fellow pastors or against another church. It's happening now. A church talking about another church. Oh, yeah, you are not doing it well. Oh, yes, you are this. Oh, yes, you are that. Then another church with the government or another church with the fake news. Different pastors with the fake news telling them, this is it. Obey what they are saying. The Bible says you should obey. The Bible says you should close your nose. The Bible says you should close the church. Is that what the word of God says? No. But that's what you see all around. That's what will be going on. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall was go. For there shall arise, that's verse 24 now, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Are they not deceiving the children of God right now? There are places that the children of God are being kept in hope. They are being kept in fear. They are afraid because their pastor says, Hide yourself. They've listened to the information that is going on. They've listened to everything that they hear all around and what they see. Hide yourself. Who is a Christian? When you are a Christian, when you, when God gave birth to you, who did you become? That is the question. Because if you know who you are, You'll be able to know what can happen to you. You'll be able to know what anyone can do to you. Jesus said, I am the one that died for them. So the question is, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? Let me tell you some views. There are so many views. I'm not talking of among people. I'm talking about from among men of God. Mighty men of God that I respected so much. But again, the word of God is the word of God. You respect the word or not. What God, what did God say? So there are so many views out there, especially in denominational environments. Different denominations with different views. I'm going to pick only three views. The first is, if you turn from your sins, then God will forgive you and will save you from going to hell. That is one major view. You can see it. It might not be, it might not be directly, but look in the structure. Look in the preaching. Look at what they are telling you. That is what it meant. Hey, you will go to hell because you are sinning. If you don't turn away from your sin, you will go to hell. Is that what the scripture says? That when you turn away from your sin, you will go to hell. Is there anyone before Christ came that was able to turn away from their sins? Or is there anyone after Christ came that is not born again that was able to turn away from their sins before they got born again? None. You can't turn away from your sins to be born again. Look at Peter. Before Peter received the Holy Spirit, before he got born again, Peter was afraid. He denied Christ three times. Even Christ told him, the devil has been planning to seek you, but I prayed for you. That was before Peter got born again. Peter couldn't do it. Peter that was with Christ couldn't do it. The apostles, the disciples that were with Christ could not do it. They ran away. They all ran away because you can't do it when you are not born again. Because it is the power of God through the Holy Spirit that can make you to turn away from your sins. You can't turn away from your sins when you are dead. 
Have you heard a dead animal walking around? Unless you are alive before you can turn away from your sins. There is no forgiveness for the dead. The word forgiveness is being used most of the time, but there is no forgiveness for the dead. There is forgiveness for the living. There is only remission of sins for the dead. That means your sins are washed away. You are made anew. Then, when you now sin, you can be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. Then the second view that is there, which is very mighty, they call them whether the Armenian or the Calvinist, or I don't know the names they call them, but I don't care about names now, because that's historical views. If you endure affliction and persecution until the end, then you shall be saved. This one is talking about, yes, for you to know if you are saved is when you endure affliction and persecution till the end. And they will quote where Jesus spoke about, yes, there will be so many afflictions, so many things, but only those that endure to the end. But who is he talking about? I don't think Jesus was talking about the Christians. He was talking to the Jews. He was talking to the Jews that there's going to be a time like this that yes, there will be affliction. He even told them, then if you are in Jerusalem, if you are in Judea, and you see, which means he's talking to the Jews, and you see the abomination of the temple, then be prepared, because he's talking to the Jews. But that's not, so when you say until you endure affliction and persecution till the end, which means you will not know. You have to continue enduring. That was what was happening in the dark age. That people were beaten. If you commit anything, you'll be lashed. Different kind of 24 strokes, 21 strokes, 40 strokes. Their back were lashed. Some of them punished themselves. So different, different of using knife and razor blades to cut themselves. Because to them, they have sinned and they need to be purified. They have to endure. Affliction. They have to endure pains and persecution. That is when they got saved. But that is not what the Bible says. Then the third one. The third one is that a Christian can lose his salvation unless he wins souls. I've heard this one so many times from powerful men of God too. That if you call yourself a Christian, you need to start winning souls. That if you don't win souls, you will lose your salvation. Also, I don't know where that idea came from. Winning souls. You can only win souls when you are alive. Can a Muslim win souls? No. Can a Buddhist win souls? No. It is only when you are alive you can win souls. So you have to have been born again before you can win souls. You have to have been saved before you can go and win souls. He said, you shall, re you, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will now become a witness. It is after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you receive power and you become a witness. You can't be a witness before you get saved. And you can't say you are a Christian, you have power, you are a witness now because you are not winning souls. You are no more a Christian. There is no way in the Bible. He's talking about inheritance, which we will get to later. If you don't win souls, you might lose out. Not in terms of going to hell or heaven, but there are inheritance in the kingdom. And if you don't win souls, you might lose that. That is what it meant. So you need to win souls so that you won't lose out. Praise the name of the Lord. So now, what did God say? We need to go to what God said. What is God's view 
about salvation. I've just told you three major views. There are more, but three major views that people have about salvation. And you will think it's not there. Many of the churches hang on those views in their teaching. And that is why people are afraid. They laugh on Sunday, but in, on Monday to Saturday, if you see them in their rooms, they are being bombarded by devils and they are crying and begging their pastor, help me, pastor, because they don't know who they are. What is God's view? Let's start with Romans 5, from verse 6 to 8. The Bible says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does it mean? He is saying that even before you were born by your mother, Christ has already saved you. Christ, Jesus, saved the whole world. Salvation was made available for the whole world. Has Jesus done it? Yes. Jesus has saved the Muslims. The Muslims have been saved. We need to understand the difference between, because the words are always being used pari passu, interchangeably. Saved, saved, saved. But does it mean to be saved as a Christian? And what does it mean to be saved in terms of the world? What did Jesus do in terms of the world? The Bible says, from when we were yet without friends, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for everyone, for the ungodly. For seven, say, for, ra- for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, for adventure for a good man, some will even dare to die. But verse 8 says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not when you try not to be a sinner, then you are saved. Christ has already paid legally for you. He died for us all. For everybody. Let's go to John 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. The Bible says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ paid for the sins of the whole world once and for all. Let me tell you something. I always repeat this. Human, no human. I'm not talking of angels. I'm not talking of extraterrestrial um, personalities. I'm talking of human. No human will go to hell because of sin. Many in our time, in our generation, we go to hell because of not accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. Jesus has saved. If you don't accept this salvation, you go to hell. Many will go to hell because... They didn't accept Jesus Christ. None will go to hell because of, oh, they see, because Jesus has taken the whole sin away. He says, if you believe, the Bible made that so clear. Believe. If you believe in him, if you believe in him, if you believe in him, if you believe in him. Let's go to John 1 from verse 29. He said, the next day, John said Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He didn't say past. He didn't say present. He didn't say future. With God, there is no time. When he said the sin of the world, from eternity past to eternity future, the sin of this our human generation was taken away. By Jesus Christ. Once. That is what the Bible says. And that is what Paul, I mean, John was saying there. Behold the lamp of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 
from verse 1 to 5. And you had he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. We are in, in time past, you walk according to the causes of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we are by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Even when we were dead with God, there is no past, no present. Even when we were dead in sins, he had, he has already done it. He quickened us before. He quickened us before. How did he do it? Because he paid with his blood. He paid with his blood. Let's look at the parable of the hidden treasure. In Matthew 13, verse 44. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, tre unto treasure hid in a field. The which when a man had found, he hid it, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he had, and by that field. The world is the field. But in that field, there are treasures. He saw the treasure. So he bought the whole field. The whole field belongs to him. But he bought the whole field because of the treasure that is in it. What does that mean? Jesus paid for the world. He paid for the sin of the world because of the treasure that is in it. Jesus didn't pay for some specific people. Yes, when you come to him, remember, the Bible says, it is not the will of God for any to perish. And that's a fact. It's not the will of God for any to perish. So we need to understand that Jesus paid for the whole world. If Jesus paid for the whole world, which means there is nothing like sin that we stop a child of God from going to heaven. If you accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, and you confess him, why you believe in your heart that he is the son of God? He died, he was buried, and he resurrected. And you confess him as the Lord of your life, you are saved. There is a translation in your life. You are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Then from there onward, a new game began. That we will talk in the next video. Oh, Father, we worship you. We glorify your holy name. We adore you, Lord, Father. We glorify, we honor you. In the next video, we'll be talking about how do we get saved. But, Father, we know that it is only by you are we saved. We honor you, we praise you, we adore you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen.